Welcome everyone to our discussion of The Soil and the Sea, a film that is directed by Danielle Rugo and produced by Carmen Abujaudeh. Um, for those of you who may not know me, I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Comparative Literature here at Brown University. I work on the cultural infrastructure of Beirut in the 1960s and into the 1980s during the Lebanese Civil War. And I'm interested in questions of aesthetics, politics, and how they center around visuality. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, Danielle Rugo is an award-winning filmmaker and scholar whose main interests are in documentary and conflict, world cinema, and film philosophy. The Soil and the Sea is his most recent film, which was released in 2023. It unveils the violence that lurks beneath unremarkable places like a garden, a cafe, a hotel, and other sites in an effort to um, perhaps cinematically exhume the mass graves that um, lie underneath these sites as a consequence of the Lebanese Civil War. His previous film, uh, About a War, which was co-directed or co-made with Annie Weaver, um, from 2018 explores violence and change through the testimonies of former fighters from the same war. Danielle is also a professor of film currently based at Brunel um, University in the UK, and he has held a number of former teaching positions at institutions um, around the world, including Goldsmiths, University of London, as well as Dartmouth College in the US and the University of Melbourne in Australia. And Carmen Abujaudi, who might be running a little bit late due to some technical difficulties uh, getting online in Beirut, is a researcher and lecturer in political science and is a, transi a transitional justice expert at the American University of Beirut, Université Saint-Joseph de Beirut, and the Holy Spirit University of Kaslik in Lebanon. And she holds teaching positions at all three institutions. Between 2011 and 2015, she worked with the International Center for Transitional Justice, where she served as head of the program and as head of its office in Lebanon. From 2016 to 2022, she was on the advisory board of the NGO called ACT for the Disappeared. Her fields of research include post-war memory in Lebanon and the issue of missing persons and transitional justice. In July 2020, she was appointed as a member of the National Commission for the missing and forcibly disappeared. So we're so excited uh, to have you here, Danielle, and to have Carmen as well, um, and to have had the opportunity to screen this very important film among the Brown community, and to now be in conversation with you. So welcome. Thank you very much, Liman. Thank you um, for the kind invitation and for a very generous uh, conversation. Absolutely. And here is Carmen now. Hello. 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 Good to have you, Carmen. We can Hello. Hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well. Wonderful. So I, I had just um, introduced Danielle and introduced you, and I was saying um, how excited we are to begin this conversation about this important film. Um, and uh, I just wanted to send a brief uh, note to the audience members. Uh, we are so excited to have your questions come through. As you might be familiar with the webinar format, please do type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of the, of the Zoom screen, and I will monitor that and read them out as we go along. All right. So um, I'm going to begin with a question about the production of this film and, and its premise. And I, I suppose this question can be addressed to both you, Danielle, and Carmen. Um, but starting with Danielle, you know, this is not your first experience making a film about the Lebanese Civil War. Um, your film with Abby that came out in 2018 about a war explores uh, violence and change, but from, as I said, the perspective of its former fighters and testimonies from the fighters who participated in the war. Whereas this one, The Soil and the Sea, prioritizes perspectives of civilian victims and um, their families. 
So can you tell us a little bit more about what prompted the making of this film, especially from the perspective of its subject matter? Yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, Dima, for the question. And um, hello, everyone. Delighted to be here to talk to you. Um, the, as you said, the, the premise of the previous film was to um, address how former combatants um, add or had failed to transition back into civilian life. And the film that Abby and I did was trying to look also at how exemplary the figure of the former combatant was in terms of um, allowing us to see the failed reconciliation or the failed transitional justice mechanisms that have not allowed the country to really fully move beyond um, a kind of permanent low intensity war or a permanent post-war uh, scenario. Um, and so in a way, it tried to address uh, issues that had remained unanswered. And in a sense, what this film tries to do is something similar. It, it taps into what is perhaps the most uh, pressing open a wound from, from the conflict, which is that of the more than 17,000 people who have been forcefully disappeared and have not been accounted for, neither in terms of um, the circumstances around their disappearances, nor in terms of where their uh, remains might be, if they are indeed dead, or where they, be, they are now, if they are still alive. So the idea is to look at a different perspective, but still try to work on those elements of the conflict that are unresolved and that in a way reflect um, or mirror some of the unresolved tensions that exist in contemporary Lebanese society. Um, and that in a way perpetuate, as I said, this kind of low intensity civil war atmosphere, if not the uh, reality in terms of combat, certainly an atmosphere of perennial tension, which of course is plays out often around geopolitical alliances and so on and so forth. But the idea was really to see the long legacy of a conflict of this kind and what had been left open. And in a way, both issues, and this becomes very apparent when you then screen the film there, and I know you wanted to know something more about this, but what, what, is, what is apparent is that, of course, these tensions and these unresolved situations that one would imagine to think more than 30 years after the war are part of the past, are actually very much part of the present. Absolutely. Um, and to just follow up on that, how did your collaboration with Carmen come about on this particular project? And has there been any other work besides The Soil and the Sea that has germinated from this collaboration between you two? So the, the, the film is part of a broader of a broader project that has a strong research element as well. Um, and as part of this uh, as part of this broader project, there are uh, publications um, that have uh, been produced, I think in 2021, the issue, a special issue of, of a journal with a more explicitly academic take on not only uh, Lebanon's memories of conflict, but memories of conflicts more generally. So a special issues of a journal that includes um, scholars from Colombia, Sri Lanka, Syria, and, and other places around the world. But there is also a pedagogical element, um, which is still being worked on, which has tried to transform fragments and elements of the film into um, pedagogical material that can be used um, for various uh, pedagogical activities, both within university context or outside of university context. So it's a it's one, the film is one element of a broader of a broader a project, yes. Wonderful. Carmen, do, would you like to add anything? Um, I mean, hi everyone. Uh, uh, look, I think that, as uh, Daniele explained, that uh, we wanted to have a different approach from, uh, of course, what has been done in the past. So mainly focusing on narratives of, uh, let's say, leaders, ex-fighters, um, perpetrators, uh, and uh, work more on what we call marginalized 
fictionalized memory. So challenging uh, dominant narratives uh, and be able to give a voice uh, to the victims and uh, maybe uh, the victims of disappearances because I work uh, at the time I worked with ACT for the Disappear, I was a board member and we had a discussion with Daniele on, on uh, what we want to work on and we thought that this topic because of uh, being a continuous suffering of the families, their struggle um, to also give them a voice and uh, in the same time, be able to talk about a, um, a a topic that is taboo in Lebanon that is related to uh, grave sites, mass graves uh, that we have uh, in Lebanon, uh, especially that Act for the Disappear uh, was doing a mapping of these grave sites. So this is how gradually the idea of working on these sites uh, with uh, uh, the voices of and the stories of uh, the victims actually came up and actually uh, with the also uh, artistic approach uh, that we'll, we'll have the uh, chance to talk about uh, with Daniele, why he decided to um, to give a more space to a landscape and uh, voices rather than faces and, and people. So this is, I'm sure that uh, later on we can talk about about that so yeah absolutely yeah and it's, it's so exciting uh hearing about how this film is embedded in a larger pedagogical context to actually have this film um circulate among the brown community and um just very quickly uh, as an interjection do you imagine this film um in terms of its reception um circulating among academic audiences specifically, or was it also meant to have a broader circulation among uh, the Lebanese population, but also the international community? I, I would say that maybe it's the, it's the other way around. So the, the, the academic um, community uh, comes out of it as a kind of secondary, if I may say, um, element in that it is not uh, a film that is aimed to uh, an academic community, um, although, of course, a lot of important conversation can be had um, within the academic community, but it's not, it's not also really a film that um, is trying to offer much of the context for what has happened, or that is trying to have a more, let's say, didascalic or illustration purpose. It doesn't really serve that aim. It does not bring the audience into contact with the historical, socio-political nuances because it's very much driven by these places and by the personal stories that um, animate them or the gap between the faces and the personal stories. So it's it's meant to definitely be... Um, it addresses the, the, the general audience. It does not address necessarily the academic community per se, uh, but of course the academic community is part of the general audience in that sense. Um, um, and, and of course, um, different audiences will respond in different ways. And this is something that uh, we've experienced with, uh, with the previous film, Abby and I. In, in Lebanon, reactions to something uh, like this of course, is um, not just more visceral, but also intersects with the lived experience, often a traumatic lived experience, of a, a, a transgenerational trauma, that is the element uh, that most immediately is used to respond to the film, to confront the film. Um, and so conversations, for instance, around the aesthetics or the formal or the, the more filmic uh, element move to the background as opposed to um, elsewhere where the, the more immediate concern of, of the audience is not that of confronting a specific past or resolving a present, uh, but instead of looking at a um, at an object, uh, at, at, a, at a filmic object, uh, first of all, and then through that to connect to the stories, whilst uh, for an audience that is familiar in a kind of first person terms and, and, and collectively with, with these stories for having lived them, um, it's much more a way to reckon 
with a certain history that is ongoing as far as I can as far as I can see much more than it is about assessing or measuring uh, the value of the work as a work. So this is something that one comes to expect to a certain extent. And it's part in a way of also how you think something like this. You think it in terms of how will this, uh, um, say a local audience, an audience that is in, has lived through some of the things you talk about, how is that audience going to respond and how open is the work to them? And now on the other hand, is the work open to those who might not have prior knowledge of the events? And um, in a way, one, I think, at least one in my position, tries to find a balance uh, between all these different things. Whether the balance is there or not, that's a different story. Um, but it is about finding this balance to make sure that a work can speak to any to the immediate needs, say, of the community it is made for or with the community you have in mind, but also more generally. And I think the the, the question of um, disappearances and mass graves is a, is a question that really is valid for so many conflicts all around the world. And in fact, we're seeing that mass graves are being created in Gaza uh, mm -hmm. following Israeli uh, airstrikes and the ongoing genocide right now. So yes. it is also true of the Ukraine. Just the other day, I saw a video of Ukrainian uh, mass graves being a tomb. It's true of Iraq, it's true of Colombia, it's true of so many different conflicts. Mm -hmm. So you want then uh, the film to join this more global uh, conversation around these issues. Yes, thank you. I did have a question about the timeliness of this film. Um, obviously, we know that it was uh, released before, prior to the um, the war on Gaza, um, ensuing after October 7. Um, and I couldn't help but notice, you know, that the film's content is obviously historical, and these images and, and the, the stories coming out of the film are of a time that is technically past, but the legacy still lives on with um, with families in Lebanon. Um, and yet we notice how incredibly timely and relevant, as you said, uh, these devastating realities and traumas that result from war, specifically with the, the weaponization of mass graves as a attempt to obliterate the memory of a place, the memory of a people, and even to hide and sort of bury under under the ground, many layers under the ground, these victims who are evidence, really, of war crimes. Um, my question about this is regarding the image and specifically how we as a global audience of the war on Gaza and even the war on Ukraine have received these images through social media, right? Circulating on social media platforms, images and footage that is incredibly, um, that is incredibly graphic and live and violent. In comparison to the images that are used in your film, do you feel that um, this retrospective aspect of, of producing images about events that are considered historical can be just as potent as the live image on social media? Or is it different? Both. It is different and, yes, can be equally significant. It is different because there is an immediacy to the image you receive on social media that makes that image even more partial. It is, of course, a document. It is, of course, uh, evidence of something, and it is crucially important, in particular at a moment where international journalists are not allowed access to Gaza, it's important that people on the ground document this. The Palestinian journalists document this, and they're paying a very high price for documenting this, given how many journalists Israel is killed in the last four months. But of course, once images are um, put in a sequence inside the film, you are constructing a framework around them. So you are constructing a, a framework or their legibility, if you want, or illegibility, or maybe you're asking the audience to confront the inability to completely make sense of what you're seeing or to completely um, reduce the image to its pure uh, legibility, to its pure meaningfulness. There's, there's an element of the image that remains opaque. And of course, in a film, you have the space and the time to organize that, to organize that um, discourse, but also you have a lot more space and time, I think, to 
pay attention to the image, and I mean you making the images, you have a lot more space and time to listen to the image, um, to to really try and understand what the image demands of you, what what the, the unicity of the image demands of you. Something that you do not have the time and space to do when you are receiving images that are most of the time extremely um, um, difficult due to the extremely explicit nature of their violence. And so it's difficult to organize a response to these images because they are immediately violating or even the, the codes that we learn uh, uh, to, to confront images of war. There's an excess of violence there that is very difficult to, to attend to. There's a shock element that in a way takes everything else away. And so these images are, are important, but I think they will become more important the more time goes on. The images of Gaza that we see now, I think will become more important in two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, the significance, the significance of images such as these ones does not deplete in time. In fact, mm -hmm. it's enhanced by the passing of time. Um, what we can see, unfortunately, of these images is that they're not providing in themselves redemption in the sense that they are not actually speaking to those that they should speak to. This is something, though, that we cannot blame on the image or on the image producers. We have to blame these on the perpetrators who have become, they, not us as the general audience, they have become numb to the suffering that they are producing. And this is something we, in a way, could never ask the image. The perpetrators have never been stopped by images made of them. This has never happened. And it's why we have a long visual culture of atrocity that has never really managed to stop the perpetrators as they were doing what they were, what they're doing. Right. That's a good point. And um yeah, the Israelis are posting images themselves of yes. looting or burning or all sorts of violations. Um mm -hmm. this is maybe something new, but um, there is no sense in which the image is um, really managing to act as a barrier, if you want, against the violence. Yes. And um, I see a question in the Q&A, which, by the way, for people who have um, perhaps entered late or joined the conversation a little bit after I made this um Direction is to uh, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and I will be happy to read them out as they um, fall into the fold of the discussion, or perhaps towards the end. We do have a question from uh, a guest, um, Jana Al-Khatib, um, on this particular subject, and I'm just going to read her question to the filmmakers. I'm wondering if they can speak to how proximity impacts victims' abilities to remember and to narrate. We see in Gaza, for example, victims narrating their own genocide in real time, whereas the Lebanese are narrating with some distance, as you, as you mentioned, Danielle. And um, adding to the sort of conversation we've been having, do we see examples during the Lebanese civil war of people narrating in real time as perhaps people in Gaza now are doing, or is this a phenomenon of the social media age? Do you want me to respond to this? Uh, of course, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, we're talking about uh, a, a conflict that happened between 1975 and 90, so we didn't have social media, but we had the mainstream media. I remember very well because I lived through the war. So we could see mainly on the mainstream. So we had only the one, uh, uh, the national uh, TV. Uh, so it was possible with some reports um, on the radio as well and the written, so the press. So it was possible to read a bit, but it's not the same. So it's obviously social media, uh, what we call also citizen journalism, uh, as you know, so it's always, uh, it, it wasn't possible at the time. Um, uh, but still, we had a sense of, uh, you know, what, what was happening. I mean, uh, 
uh, even though I was very young, but I mean, uh, we, we knew at least in our community uh, because it was very difficult to know what's happening on the other side. So this is something that, I mean, obviously I, I, I wasn't aware. Uh, I had to travel abroad to be, uh, to know better about the other narrative and the other, you know, suffering as well. Uh, so yes, there's a big difference. We know very well and I mean, in terms of social media, how much it's uh, in Syria, for example, the conflict in Syria is it has been also very well documented. In Lebanon, the conflict hasn't been well documented. And this is why the work that has been done since the end of the war, and I would say in the past 10 or 20 years, there is uh, some effort to document uh, uh, what happened during the war through um, also we can include the uh, filmmaking, but also the work of uh, photographs and uh, the role of also of many artists and, and uh, novelists as well. Mm -hmm. And this is why Elias Khoury contributed to uh, this documentary because he was someone who uh, through his uh, work uh, as a novelist, but also as a journalist, uh, contributed to this reflection around the war and giving some space to um, and narratives uh, like the victims narratives and uh, so yeah there is there is a difference uh, and of course since the end of the war and especially in the past 10 or two, 20 years uh, we know better about uh, uh, I mean the, the struggle but uh, that happened actually during the war so like the families of the missing started during the war their mm -hmm. struggle to know the fate of the missing so uh, but Again, through um, uh, in, in the, the past 20 years, there is more work uh, around the, 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 the stories and the narratives of, of the victims and ordinary people as well. There's many projects on oral history uh, that are also very interesting podcasts and mm -hmm. other uh, support. Yeah. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Can I add, can I add a yes. brief... Uh remark on this um i think also it depends what you mean by narrating if narrating just means to to speak to a camera if this narration is just verbal where you, you talk about what has happened but if the narration is as i believe it is also uh, embodied uh, and it's about body language and it's about precisely images then of course to a certain extent this is true of every conflict that people narrate if not in real time, as it is happening now, almost in real time. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of um, when Abby and I were making about a war, we looked through quite a lot of footage and a particularly striking in terms of the narration was the footage from the Sabla and Shatila massacre in 1982 and from the war of the camps. In both cases, you have people narrating to the camera what has happened to them. Whether this could be broadcasted immediately, live or not, uh, that's a, a different story. The War of the Camps, for instance, was not really very well covered outside of Lebanon, and in, in, even in Lebanon. So there wasn't that live broadcasting option because the eyes of the world were not on it. Um, but but the victims narrating that ex their experience, this is something that I think has a longer history than social media. And I think I think very often, we tend to see the present as inaugurating a completely new phase of everything. I think we need, in particular when it comes to war, to be able to put things into a longer, broader sequence. And I'm thinking also connecting to the, the issue before about what the, these images can do and what they're broadcasting live and life can do. In themselves, the images do not reveal, for instance, um, whether this is genocide or not, for instance. And I'm referring here to a text by Ariel Azulay, who I know is, is, is part, of, part of Brown, um, who she published recently Seeing Genocide, where precisely she's insisting on this idea, and I think this is extremely important, to connect the images of the Gaza being raised to the ground, of the in making Gaza in, uninhabitable, to mm -hmm. the, the images of 48 or 47, 49, and then to images of the ongoing Nakba. It's important to see these images as they connect to a long sequence of dispossessions, of massacres, and so on and so forth. In this sense, then, once connected with this longer temporality, then these images become really revealing. 
But this is something perhaps you cannot do as easily on social media. And, and of course, you can do in a film. Because right. in a film, you can disrupt time in a way that you can't read on social media. And social media has this kind of chronological feature. You know, the latest thing that you see is the latest thing that has happened. It's very, it's quite chronological in that sense. It's quite linear. Mm -hmm. uh, cinema is a lot less linear. So we also need to think, I think, through the each medium or rather properties that medium media can have and how they then allow us to access information in one way rather than another. I, I still believe uh, that cinema has an extraordinary power precisely because it can unsettle time in a way that the liveness uh, of all the streaming and social media uh, that we have today cannot quite do in, in the same fashion. That's wonderful. Um, and I think I completely agree. Um, and just more on the power of the image um, before I turn to a question about um, the filming and the interviewing process for Carmen. But this is a question, I suppose, for Danielle. On this part in this particular documentary, um, the image itself is, it didn't strike me as particularly violent or grotesque or even graphic, right? No. And, you know, in continuing this, um, this contrast or difference with the social media image. But these images in the film are simply disturbing, perhaps because of the lingering shots that make the viewer uncomfortable and sort of ask you as a viewer to sit with the the haunting present absence of these victims and their stories and the voiceovers from the families that are coming to you and make those connections with the places that, which are obviously contemporary scenes that seem to be almost eerily, eerily peaceful and kind of haunting in a sense and ghost-like and empty. Um, so it's a different type of power, I suppose. And this particular technique of, of using the image, really the camera um, speaking for itself almost, is very different from techniques that have been used in films about the Lebanese Civil War, like films by Maroun Baghdadi and Ziad Dwayri and others. And so um, why, as a director, did you choose to go in this particular direction? Yeah, I think you are you are absolutely right in terms of the image is almost quite neutral. Um, and whilst it's true that the films that you mentioned do something very different, and in general, I think um, films about conflict, war, tend to really have this immediacy where you are staying with the action in one way or another. And if you can't because the conflict is past, you try to recreate the action um, through dramatic reconstruction or through archive and so on and so forth. However, there is a whole tradition of landscape filmmaking that intersects the issue of violence in a very meaningful way. And so one specifically that is close to the topic here, uh, and I happened to re-watch it last night, is a film by a Japanese filmmaker called Masawa Dachi on the PFLP. So he made this film, he might be Declaration of World War, it's called. Um, it's a film of the PFLP, but it's very much, a, you, you really can tell that this is a film about the Lebanese landscape, where at the time, it's a film from 1972, where at the time, the PFLP was training. And you really, the the, the human figures, the, the, the Fedain, the fighters, are really dwarfed by the landscapes. And then, of course, Adachi is the one who created in Japan this movement called Fukeiron, which is this movement around landscape cinema as a political tool. Um, and he made this uh, film called AKA Serial Killer, which is now a bit of a cult film, where he, he tried to reconstruct the, um, the background of a, of a serial killer only through landscape shots, completely empty landscape shots, where you never see the person who's committed these crimes and you never see um, anything about this person, just the places where he lived and worked. And this kind of, um, for for other chi, the, the kind of um, conformism of the mm -hmm. Japanese suburban landscape for him was a way to get to the character and to the uh, motives perhaps 
behind his, his killing spree. So something similar is happening here. This is the this is the groove uh, in a way that is being uh, worked. Can you do you mind saying what the name of that film from nineteen seventy two was again? Yeah, it's called uh, Red Army slash PFLP Declaration of World War, something like that. It's it's so the, the the Red Army, the Japanese Red Army worked for a little while with the PFLP in the early days. We're talking about before the the, the Japanese, sorry, the Lebanese Civil War. Um, they supported them in a number of operations, hijacking and so on and so forth, to the point where some of them then moved to Lebanon mm -hmm. and, and lived in Beirut for forever. Um, and Adachi, who was involved in this in this uh, in this kind of left wing uh, politics, uh, made a film um, with the PFLP in and around Beirut. So there's some material in the film in Beirut. There's an interview with uh, Hassan Kanafani as well in the film, but mm -hmm. also then then of, in some of the training camps uh, in more rural area, mountainous areas. Um, but whilst you would expect a film like this to really, Leila Khaled is also featured in that, you expect a film like this to really feature action and mostly mm -hmm. people talking, but actually there is an uncanny attention for the landscape. Um, which you can really then you tap into their history and that um, visual cultures where he's coming from, and you realize that this is someone for whom landscape filmmaking was a whole political, as well as of course aesthetic endeavor. And then you understand that there is there is something that can be done again in this fashion. Um, the some American filmmakers who have then tried that again in, in, in a different context, but James Benning is one of them. Um, it really is about playing with the ability of the landscape both to reveal something and at the same time to completely withdraw and conceal. That's so interesting. Thank you. Um, I want to turn now to a question I think would perhaps um, be meant for Carmen about the interviews and how you navigated um, together, how you navigated uh, performing these interviews with the families of the victims. Um, I noticed that they were done with people from many different areas in Lebanon, you know, from Anjar to Furnishbek to Hadat um, Shatila, obviously, in Tripoli, Damur. There are even stories that come out of Tadmur prison in Syria. Um, and I'm curious whether this sort of broad geographical coverage was meant to show that the war's violence uh, was um, indiscriminate and sort of touched people from all sects and across villages and cities in Lebanon. Yeah, you say that all uh, exactly. It's exactly what happened. So um, in in all region almost. Um, across uh, let's say uh, you know sectarian lines or ethnicity because also uh, not only the Lebanese who were targeted but also Palestinians and other nationalities of people who uh, lived in Lebanon or participated in the conflict during the war uh, we tried to cover as much as possible it wasn't possible to cover all the region you can imagine in some places it was difficult to uh, really film or uh, uh, so it was also we had a selection of uh, over 30 uh, locations so uh, related to the work of act with the sapir so the the mapping uh, we wanted to uh, cover as much as possible but in some places we knew that it was difficult to film uh, sometimes uh, we had the location, but we didn't find uh, witnesses or people willing to talk. Uh, mm. So we end up with this selection that is as much as possible balanced. And I'm happy to know that for you, uh, uh, it was a an attempt to, to really cover uh, most of the cases or at least a category of, of cases. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the interviews actually it was um, uh, through the organizations but also our network of people uh, we know um, it wasn't always easy to to find the right people the people who wanted to talk uh, we also made many interviews that we didn't use we we needed also 
to, to make so few accepted to have their names and we took the decision not to name actually uh, any of of the people who, who talked so uh, we're talking about survivors uh, families but also witnesses um Mm -hmm. um, so with the help of uh, Yara Almer, who is also uh, a researcher and a journalist, we, um, we did this interviews in different places in Lebanon. So, uh, yeah. So I realize that it's impossible for any film to kind of paint a comprehensive picture. And, yeah. you know, maybe building on what you're saying about uh, challenges with certain people who maybe were hesitant to talk or maybe challenges in, in certain areas to film. I was curious, you know, the South is noticeably absent from this film, the stories and oral histories from uh, victims in, in massacres and and the parts of the war that, that infiltrated yeah. the South of Lebanon. I was wondering, were there any particular challenges coming up there? I think it's it's clear that the South it's a place until this minute actually there is a war in the south of Lebanon. Uh, there's attacks uh, from Israel and also the Hezbollah that is very present in the south. So we knew from the beginning that even though we thought about, for example, uh, trying to find the former detainees in Khiam, uh, because we. We think that, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, detainees, some of them were considered as uh, uh, disappeared or forcibly disappeared or considered as uh, uh, people who might have information. Uh, but uh, we decided that we cannot film there. You know, it's also very risky. You need to have an authorization from the army and sometimes in some location from the Hezbollah. So we avoided uh, really it. To, to to go and film there or try to find people to interview. Um, but we worked on Damur. Damur, as you know, is uh, the Shouf, but it's on uh, the borders, uh, let's say, the, the southern borders uh, uh, between the, the Shouf and the south. Um, but uh, this is a decision we, we took with the... Um, NGO that uh, we don't want also to take risk. We're talking about of the context that is still sensitive, affected by conflict, whether many actors um, still very present. So we try to avoid uh, these locations and not to really expose uh, the team as well. I see. Okay. And um, there was a question from an audience member, Audrey, who wanted to know, was there a need to fact check the narratives? And if so, how was that process done? Thank you, Audrey. Audrey was my student at uh, AUB in Lebanon, so I'm happy to have her here. Um, actually, uh, these stories were cross-checked by the NGO. So some of these stories, especially the families, are well known. Uh, well known in, in the case, I mean, they, they, they were documented before uh, by the NGO. So we wanted also to make sure that these narratives are um, I mean, we, we, we cannot challenge these narratives. These are the memories of the people, you know, so the people are telling their own story. So this is also the risk when we talk about a narrative. So we're not talking about historians who are giving us, you know, facts. So this is uh, their uh, testimony. This is their story. This is how they live through these events. Um, uh, and we had also a witness, so who, who saw what happened. So uh, we cannot really uh, check what what he, uh, you know, was telling us, for example, in the Damur case, um, mm -hmm. but this is not the first time. And he actually uh, took the initiative to, during a conference to talk about, you know, what he witnessed, uh, for example, when he was a, a child. So we wanted to include him, uh, even though we cannot really uh, check, you know, what he was telling us but the massacre is well known and it seemed for us plausible and, and something that we cannot we can't take and and um 
add to the narratives around, uh, you know, the massacre that happened in Damur. Uh, so uh, some of these narratives were um, um, published. So some even of uh, the, the grave sites were known um, in the media. Um, and this is how we proceeded. So in, in terms of letting people talk, but uh, uh, trusting, you know, their, their narratives, because the idea was also to give them a voice. Uh, but in the same time, uh, the locations were documented. We, right. we didn't choose a place that I mean, uh, randomly, it was yeah. always uh, documented by this organization, and uh, we trusted as well uh, uh, our sources and uh, the people we, we worked with. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Audrey, for the question. Um, <clears throat> I would like to circle back to this question about the landscape uh, cinema and landscape images from a uh, audience member, Matteo, raises the question uh, perhaps to Danielle about something we spoke a little bit about, which is the, the film doesn't really show violent scenes. Um, and even the, the victims and the witnesses' faces are not shown, right? Uh, there are only voiceovers and they are um, disembodied voices. Um, so Mateo's question is, why did you decide to, to do this? What was it for the poetic effect of the film and was it also intended to protect the privacy of those who participated in the film to, to choose to not show their faces? So I think it's um, it's both, as always is the case with film, because unlike, say, literature or music or poetry or painting, you have to deal with a reality that you can't quite move out of the way and you cannot, you can alter it but you cannot fully control it so we had this uh, to face this dilemma which was that most people would not want to be identified and if most people cannot be identified then you end up with a film full of testimonies that you cannot see now you can go down the route of blurring certain things and um, that's of course an option but then the aesthetic of the film will have to actually account for this anonymity in ways that are more nuanced than just blurring. Obviously, blurring is the first thing you go to. Um, but really, as I said before, you know, the, the idea was to start from places straight away. And was also, you know, the, really the engine of the film, Dima, you mentioned at the beginning that the film tries to cinematically exhume. Um, I think actually the, the 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 point of the film was to play on the on various gaps, and the various gaps try to reflect or articulate the reality, if you want, of the situation, which is that even as is shown in the final scene, even when you have human remains, you don't really have the option to identify and match those remains with the DNA. So that there is is not really about evidence. It is uh, about navigating a series of interruptions and gaps because there is no political, not just technical framework to work within to produce exhumations. So on the one hand, then you have certain landscapes that are not really um, giving you the evidence you want. They're not mm -hmm. showing you exactly what the remains are. They're not showing you the remains. On the other, you have testimonies that do not really confirm what you're seeing and yeah. do not produce an image of themselves. And so you have just this series of gaps, this series of uh, this inability to match all of the elements that you have to produce something coherent. And this was only possible, obviously, if you predicated the film on this basis rather than trying to produce an evidence that is not there right so it's in a way the opposite of exhuming if you want is is working within the gaps within the the lats um with, with between the the yes yes between the gaps and, and installing the film there in the gaps as opposed to for instance if you know if you did a more forensic type of work mm -hmm. 
say that the work of someone like forensic architecture does is uh, many other very important agencies that work in this field, you would try to find use the visual medium to produce some kind of evidence that can be used. And the strategy here is not that. Right. Yes, I think that the film does that brilliantly and sort of it, it reflects this, uh, the logic of gaps and interruptions in its aesthetics very, very well. And that's very peculiar, I think, for a documentary to do something like that. Um, very non-traditional, and I I enjoyed it very much. Um, we do have a question from the audience about a particular scene in the film. Um, Ibrahim asks, given the film, given that the film revolves around the concept of urban memory, the majority of the shots depict landscapes devoid of human presence or with a lesser emphasis on human-centered elements, with the exception of the parade scene. I'm curious about the significance of this particular scene. Could you please explain its significance? Thank you. Mm. I don't know if I can. I mean, meaning that, thank you, Brahim, for the question. It's very interesting, question, but I don't know if I already, maybe I need a bit more time to really think through that. Of course, um, so the parade is the parade for the commemoration I can give you context, I mean, you wouldn't be able to see from the film, but it's a commemoration of the Sabra and Shatila massacre in September, that happened in September 82, and every September, members of the Palestinian community in Lebanon, as well as uh, people from abroad, come and celebrate, celebrate, commemorate what has happened there. And of course, um, this was a way to make that moment, if you want, present, without introducing any other element. Uh, but you still again end up with an absence in the end because you the, the sequence is structured like this. You begin um, with this moment of the in the camp today, and the, the camp is present and it's lively, and there's the commemoration, there's music, and then slowly the, the, the sequence empties itself. You leave the camp, you go to the Cité Sportive, and then when you come back, the camp is completely empty. You then don't at that point don't hear anything, don't see anybody. Just this kind of uh, very um, kind of presences that move very softly around, um, and in a way, the attempt was that of recreating um, the maybe unconsciously, maybe conscious. I don't know, but of recreating what had happened during the massacre. You, know, you have this feeling of bodies. Uh, this is a moment of agitation, and then this complete emptiness, which is the an emptiness of death. Um, and this is, in a way, was the movement. Just talking about the movement as a, a musical piece, the movement of the sequence was built in that way. But I cannot say much more than this. Really, I cannot explain in any more detail uh, than that. That's okay. I think it's worth revising and perhaps time and distance will allow more interpretation to come in. Um, maybe maybe I would I would suggest uh, that someone can take one, one once in a sense from that. Uh, I, 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 I as every as always, don't have a definite uh, say on, on what people will take yeah. and what people will uh, will uh, judge assess from the film. It's difficult. So we we do have five minutes left until the hour, and I I have a couple of comments from one uh, guest attendee that I would like to read out, and if there is time to wrap up with a final question, I'll do so. So Brian Randall um, says he was a an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps in 1975. For a br very brief period, his battalion seemed as if it might be sent to Lebanon at the beginning of the Civil War. His knowledge of Lebanon was only slightly deeper today than it was at that time. He says, my ignorance of Arabic helped in a sense to make the viewing of the film somewhat clearer in that I did not view the film through the lens of knowing which faction the speakers came from. And the universi universality of the suffering was very powerful. And this was his first comment. His second comment is that the thought late in the film which posed the dilemma of choosing to know the details of a family member's fate 
This is uh, from um, the victim in Damur. Whether to know the details of a family member's fate, if it would potentially provoke the suffering or death of, a, of another person today. Uh, Brian thought that this point was particularly powerful in dealing with the Lebanese tragedy or similar ones around the world and its potential resolution. Thank you, Brian. Um, would either of you like to add anything to those comments? I think what the, what he's saying is is clear. It's true. I mean, I mean, in terms of the testimony of the witness and how he doesn't want to take any risk in terms of knowing the fate that this might expose um, people to. Um, I mean, it, it, that they they might, you know, be killed uh, because we're, we're trying to know, uh, you know, who, who, who's buried. And so the thing, it shows that the, the, the conflict continues, actually, mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, it's very difficult to deal with this question, also taking into consideration that uh, uh, families and people uh, uh, see the grave, uh, you know, the, the, the process of exhumation or uh, very risky and that you need also to listen to the different views, how we want to deal with grave sites. So uh, some people want, you know, they want to know, they want to remain, the others uh, um, might decide not you know, to do an exhumation because of the risk, because, you know, so we need to be able to listen to these different views and, you know, how we want to approach uh, the issue of uh, of the missing in Lebanon. Uh, so it's, it's very true and relevant. Uh, thank you for sharing. And so um, <clears throat> a final question from Claire in the audience was wondering, apart from this discussion, will there be any online screening of the film that we are discussing, um, you know, and perhaps Danielle, you could share uh, with us the plans for whether this film will be viewable online um, or with the audience via chat, especially if they uh, might not have seen the the film prior, the 48 hours prior to the discussion. I can, um, yes, I can put details, um, details of that in the chat. I think it's, it's probably easier and it's, it's, it could be an actual link. Um, Sure. And anyway, on our website, all this information is is uh, available. But yeah, I'll I'll put something in the in the chat, and everybody can uh, can access it that way, or uh, from Monday actually. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, since we are um, well, actually, the you can you can share it with me, and and I will sort of share it then with the audience if that uh, makes sense. Because you you cannot access the audience directly through this interface uh, technology. Um, all right, so thank you both very much for this um, very illuminating and perhaps difficult discussion that we've had. Um, I really enjoyed being in conversation with you both. Thank you uh, for taking the time in the various parts of the world that you are in. Uh, to do this and to be in conversation also with the audience members who raised very interesting questions as well. Indeed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you Thank very you much for everyone. hosting us. Of course. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. A pleasure.